the premise behind this is just the universal response of the authorities in essentially all the advanced countries was, oh boy, we blew it. We didn't have anybody that was looking across the financial system. If we'd only had macroprudential policy, we wouldn't have found ourselves in, in this position, the, the don't start here part. Um, but there's not been a lot of work trying to figure out exactly, you know, well, whether macroprudential uh, policy will work. And I think the spirit of this exercise is to say, well, let's just do a replay of the last uh, crisis. In one way, uh, that's an easy test because it was designed, I mean, the responses were designed having seen everything we're going to talk about. Of course, it, they were designed in the heat of battle and, you know, Dodd-Frank passed in 2010. Uh, so we don't, didn't have the full evaluation of that. But on the other hand, uh, I'm sure Dan will say at some point that one of the biggest reforms was just to raise the level of capital. And so the exercise we're going to do is to replay the last crisis where we're not going to assume the capital started at 10% or anything like that. So think of, the way we think of this is imagine you found yourself uh, where you know, circumstances evolved to where you wake up one day and discover you're massively short in terms of capital. What, you know, what would you do and what would you be able to do? And, and so that's, that's where we're going to go. The paper is divided into these four parts. Most of uh, what I'm going to skip today is in section one because it's a, a replay of a linear combination of what Andre and Daryl talked about. So I'll give our theory of the case just very briefly, and then I'll spend most of my time on these second two things. You know, what would it have taken to do something about this, and you know, are the authorities up to it? For our purposes, we're not going to get bogged down into exactly why these imbalances emerge, whether it's beliefs or bad supervision or whatever. We're just going to uh, announce, here's the things that you'd have to deal with, and then are you going to be able to do it? And we're going to have a two-part theory of what went wrong. Uh, the first was emphasized a lot in Daryl's paper. Here's a few of the numbers that we have in, in ours about how the system was fragile. The key takeaway from this was because of of this explosion of leverage, uh, with small losses, the financial system became impaired and was um, possibly holding the economy back due to a credit crunch. So that's one concern that um, we think is is there, and you know that's broadly accepted as part of what we do with financial regulations. We want to make the system resilient enough to be able to escape that. Here's our version of uh, a Mian and Sufi-like uh, scatter plot that reinforces some of the things that just shows that household debt is somewhat predictive of big problems. And it's not uh, an idiosyncrasy to the United States, across countries, across time. You see consistently with you know pretty similar slopes in these scatter plots. So that's pretty compelling that you know if you get your debt out of hand, you know, you're you're at risk for trouble. So the idea that we should have done something to make the system more resilient uh, on the lender side is, is pretty um, pa uh, passe, everybody accepts that. The harder question is, what do you want to do about household indebtedness and general borrower resilience? So the stark version of this is, are you worried enough about this potential aggregate demand externality that when the households start cutting back on their spending, and in the UK case, they don't default because the loans are with recourse. So all it is is just peer cutbacks in consumption. Mark referenced the hockey stick. What he was talking about is you can look at what people's debt to income ratios were or what their debt service uh, to, to income were and look at the change in consumptions. And you see when people get into that far right tail where they're pretty heavily indebted, they cut back uh, spending quite aggressively. And that's a finding across a bunch of places. Are you going to put that in the macro pro remit or not? The Bank of England does, and we're going to say that to understand and, and to prevent a, a replay of the last crisis, you would have had to do something about this. Okay, so our working uh, estimate is that the one simple way to just um, estimate the size of the cost of the crisis is to just look at the deviation from trend. The details of how you draw the trend aren't particularly important. This is a 20-year average if you just say, you know, by 2010, we were something like 8.5% short of the level of GDP. And there's lots and lots of other estimates that suggest this is big. 
Um, all that coming despite the fact that you know, there weren't that many banks that failed, um, and yet we had this big macro fallout. So the part of the paper that I'm gonna skip uh, over the most is assembling a literature review and then a standardization exercise to try to translate what a bunch of different uh, papers have found about what contributed to the drop in GDP. And so um, these, these studies vary in the, the quality of the identifying assumptions or the plausibility of the identifying assumptions. Narrower studies tend to be um, probably pretty tightly identified, but perhaps conservative in terms of what you could extrapolate for the macro costs. So we have a whole bunch of studies, I think there's 12 or 13 of them in the end, that we use to estimate these things. Our punchline is that um, a fair bit of the collapse in GDP could be traced to either the credit crunch or the deleveraging. Um, and so we're not, it doesn't really matter for our purposes, but um, the exact numbers, but the idea is that if you only attended to one of these, you, you wouldn't be able to have headed things off. And so if, if you are looking for teaching and data to show your students, there's a whole bunch more that goes behind this picture. Okay, so now we have this kind of two-part test. Now I'm gonna switch to the, the meat of the macro pro part of all of this. So question number one, is it realistic to think that you could have seen that the risk of a credit crunch and the risk of deleveraging was developing in real time. And then question two, what would you have had to do or what would you have wanted to do to head that off? And we're gonna take steps two, three, and four as the ingredients that would be necessary to prevent the credit crunch and the deleveraging. But I wanna start with question one, which is imagine we operate as we do now, what would you have been likely to be able to catch? Now, um, somebody mentioned earlier this um, very prescient briefing that the FOMC re received in 2005 about the state of the housing market in the United States. So the staff estimate, if you look from the date of that FOMC meeting to the trough of what action actually happened with respect to housing prices, housing prices I think dropped 19%, the staff forecast was that they were 20% overvalued. So it seems inconceivable that a macro pru authority wouldn't have noticed that there was a problem with the housing market. That's, we're gonna say, no, no problem there. It's likely also that you would have noticed that debt was building up. As I noted, uh, mortgage debt doubled in the six years before 2007. There was a lot of talk about um, you know, risky or borrowers getting credit and, and so on, whether we would have understood exactly uh, the fragility that was uh, embedded in those loans, not so sure, but you probably would have known something about it. Um, the hallmark of most macro pru um, innovations, the big, probably the biggest one and, and the cornerstone of many countries' macro pru um, committees is their stress testing. So that I, I associate myself with whoever said that was the turnaround in the US. Um, but to do it successfully for the last crisis, you would have had to include the shadow banks. And if you had done a stress test and you'd ignored what happened to all the broker dealers that Daryl was um, talking about, it's not clear you would have understood very much about what was going on. So it, it was probably gonna be important to find some way to pull those guys in. And then finally, um, the inner linkages and the, the, the connections, and I think this is probably the hardest bit. Um, I, if you're not down in the weeds working on this, you may not understand that we still don't have a lot of the basic data that you would need to know to do a full-on stress test. So one example, you don't generally know the counterparty of the counterparty. So except that the domino thing has an element of truth, or at least that the runs work through that kind of stuff, we don't collect that data that the measurement system in the United States in most places is still premised on something like the national accounts or maybe the flow of funds. And a lot of what you'd wanna know just still isn't even very well measured. Um, so that seems like a constraint that we ought to take seriously when we try to do our war game. Okay, so let's suppose you'd figured out that the, the banks were undercapitalized. Um, what, what would have been a plausible response? So. One way to dimension this is to just recognize that there was about 200 billion of TARP, 
that was spent on the 15 systemic institutions that we focus on in the United States, and that was, that was pretty important. Um, the obvious way to do this is this um, tool that was created through the Basel process. It's called the countercyclical capital buffer. That's a time-varying capital requirement that's layered on in the UK on the FPC. Every quarter we, we have to affirm the, the setting of that. The United States has decided the CCYB should be zero. Uh, they've, they've not used it, um, but many countries do. And so one question is, in the run-up to the uh, crisis, what would you have had to do with the CCYB to try to get the money that ultimately came from TARP into the system through private means? So the formula there shows you how you would compute that number. You'd take the 200 billion you want, you'd compare it to the asset-based, risk-weighted, you'd recognize that some of the assets are outside of the United States, so you, you can't impose capital requirements on businesses um, outside. And if you do that, you get a number of about 3%. Now, in the United States, uh, it's, it's uh, been agreed that the CCYB will never go above 25 but that's not necessarily has, has to be true. Um, if you instead took the trend of credit growth and you said you wanted to keep um, credit growth on its trend, now maybe, it, and that might be an upper bound because maybe credit had been too fast, but if you wanted to keep it on trend, you could back out what that would mean, and it gets you a number more like 4.7. If you wanted to match what happened uh, both with TARP and in the aftermath of the 2009 stress test, that gets you a number like 4.2. So let's take somewhere between three and four and a half as the ask you would have been making of the banks. We think that's a plausible number, um, so Bev, uh, wrote a paper back in 2016 pointing out how much the banks were disgorging. So between their share buybacks and their, their dividends, there was a lot going out the door. Our number is, let's assume in the middle of 2007, you'd woken up to all of this. I think Andre said it was in, in, uh, um, unescapable that there was problems by mid-2007. Just between then and Lehman, there was $67 billion that was paid out. So if you just turned off the faucet, that would have gotten you um, somewhat close. Whether you could have got the um, broker-dealers inside the regulatory perimeter, I, I think, is, is much harder. But it, it seems important to recognize, just because we have a Basel Committee on Banking and we have a bunch of banking tools, every problem isn't a banking problem. And if you're not going to attend to the shadow banking sector, uh, you, would, you would find that challenging. Again, the FPC in the UK once a year has to affirm or has to state where we think the systemic risks lie and if they're not inside uh, the part of the system for which we've got some sort of authority, we, then we make a recommendation to Parliament that they would you know, give us such authority and, and so on. But there's an active discussion once a year about where is the boundary um, and you would have had to do that in, in, in the US case. All right. Second thing you could have done was worry about the, uh, the funding instability. Um, hard to know how much the funding mismatch was, but one number uh, just to put out there as a benchmark is how much did the Fed ultimately supply. So if you add up the alphabet soup of all the different programs and count the injections, it comes to about one and a half trillion of liquidity. Now, if you'd forced the banks to term out their funding, so swap all the short-term uh, funding that they were got, uh, getting for long-term funding, um, that gets you um, a modest uh, hit on credit costs um, kind of any way you, you squeeze it. So, you, you know, the banks would have noticed it would have, it would have cost them more, but with our kind of back-of-the-envelope at estimates, we don't think that that would have been super costly. We don't make an attempt to distinguish between the credit crunch and the run on the short-term funding, because it's, it's very, very hard to estimate those things. So we're going to lump those two together when we come to trying to figure out um, the next step. On the borrower stuff, this is probably the most controversial thing for a US audience, is to imagine that you're going to stand between a willing borrower and a willing lender and say, you guys don't get to set the entire terms of your, your loan deal. We're going to interfere, slow it down, call it what you want, 
but we're potentially going to put a little bit of sand in the gears. There are three types of tools that have been used in the UK and elsewhere. The, the first is to um, do something about debt to income limits. Um, you might say that you know, no borrower or only a, a fraction X, let's say, of uh, the loans that anybody is making can be made to borrowers with debt to income above four. That's the nature of the intervention in the UK where you say that you know, 15% of, up to 15% of your mortgages can be made to these, these uh, individuals. So you're not stopping any individual transaction, but on a portfolio basis you could be interfering. We don't think that would have had a huge effect on the amount of credit that was granted. Um, there's a second thing that you, you could have done that would have been much bigger in the U.S., which was to require documentation of income. Like if you get to write down your income, you can write down whatever income you want to get under four. So if you had you know, cut back on the low doc or no doc loans, or at least verified all the income, we think that would have had a bigger impact on credit availability. And then the last thing you could do, which Mark also mentioned, is you could insist when the banks make a loan to a uh, new, new customer that they check whether or not the customer would be able to sustain the payments if interest rates were to rise. So we do a 3% stress and we check whether or not you'd still qualify for the loan in that case. So um, there's a lot more data in the paper of this sort that, that gives you a, a snapshot of what things look like. Now, that suggests then that in the U.S. case, you'd be talking about tools that we still don't have and still aren't very much discussed here, but um, they do exist elsewhere. They are used elsewhere. Um, here's a bunch of numbers that we have about how much some of these different interventions would have mattered. Um, it's, it's very hard to know what would have happened with the documentation since pres presumably some people just wouldn't have qualified at all. Okay, so do we think the regulators are up to the task? And our answer is not very favorable for the FSOC. Um, that comes for a variety of reasons. The, the first one is um, the FSOC has no um, hard legal powers beyond the ability to designate an institution is being systemic. So just to remind you, we, the, the main systemic risk control in the United States was to tell the 10 existing microprudential regulators that you ought to get together, the Secretary of Treasury will chair these meetings and you ought to talk about things. But when it comes to actually having the authority to do something, there's, there's not a lot there. Um, they can make recommendations to other regulators. There have been times when they've made recommendations that the, the so, the group can vote by two-thirds majority to say, you, SEC, go do this. The SEC can say, well, you know, we're not really convinced, so we're not going to do it. And that has happened. So um, there, have, there, there are members of this 10 uh, club of regulators that don't even have financial stability in their mandate, which is pretty important because if you go and tell the SEC, you should do this on the grounds of uh, mitigating systemic risk, and they say, well, well that's not our job. Uh, you know, you, you may think it is, but it's not our job, and you, then you have a back and forth. So the Fed can do certain things. Uh, it does control the CCYB, and it, it, it's in charge of the stress test. But nobody in the United States has the authority to do anything about household leverage. It wouldn't matter, you know, uh, Jay Powell once a month could stand up and say, I think there's a consumer credit boom that's going to end badly in the United States, and that's about all he can do. So um, there is, there's nobody that's in charge of that side of things. So if you take that perspective, the FSOC doesn't stand much of a chance. The FPC probably is better positioned. Um, the main reason is just there's a lot more tools. So we think of the FSOC and the FPC as the polar opposites. The FSOC's you know, a club without a lot of tools. The FPC's probably the most muscular financial regulator in the world. It's got a bunch of tools. Um, they, there's a role in designing the stress tests, there's um, the power to set the CCYB, there's um, sectoral capital limits, so if we wanted to, we could say uh, banks have to hold more capital for every loan that's made um, to uh, the housing market or, or you know, leveraged loans for buyouts or whatever we want. Um, we do not have tools for non-banks, but we do have the ability to try to ask for authority to move into the perimeter, and when we've made recommendations, 
as, as they've been to Parliament or to the microprudential regulator, every recommendation we've made has been accepted or every power that's been requested has been granted. Um, and as I said, we have tools to um, deal with, with uh, leverage. So in principle, it looks like an FPC-like um, authority has, has a chance. In practice, I think the answer is much less clear. So our waffling answer to the question in our title of our papers, maybe. Um, we could have said on the one hand, on the other, that would have probably been more in keeping with the NBR <laughs> standard. But um, what, would, what would it take? Um, so first thing is you'd have to have a, a mandate. So in the United States, there's been no debate over whether a macro Purdue authority should have any uh, um, scope for doing anything on the borrower side of uh, the system. Um, you would have had to be able to do something about leverage and, and the liquidity mismatches, and you would have had to try to do something about the, the household, uh, household debt. I, I think the public, if we, were, if we do have another crisis, is going to be outraged in the United States because I, I would guess most of the experts in the room would, are going to agree the FSOC is kind of toothless. So you think, how could we go through this huge crisis and then set up a response that was designed to fail? But that's kind of my view of, of where we are. It's just not set up to do this. The UK, maybe you have a chance. Um, you would have had to try to get the, the shadow banks inside the regulatory system. That would have been lobbied against ferociously. Um, and then you would have had to push the boundaries of your power, I mean, in terms of uh, forcing, uh, forcing them to recapitalize and, and then standing in between the, the borrowers. So I'm not... I'm not sure whether it would have worked, um, but at least logically it could have. So then the last part of the paper is some questions about, okay, so how did we wind up in this situation? And we think that there's these five areas that, that matter. Um, first, should, should you take comfort that somebody out there is watching and uh, we're gonna be able to identify problems in real time? Uh, we think it helps to have somebody forced to be doing that, but you might not want to assume they're going to be perfect, and so maybe you want to build some slack, extra resilience into the system. Um, how wide should the remit be? So the, the main thing is, do you want to uh, attack borrower weakness and, and do anything about borrower resilience? Um, third, most, most notably absent in the United States is these hard powers. So, does it help to have a, a regulator that can just make recommendations but has no authority to actually follow through? Um, pretty hard. Fourth, um, how activist should you be and what's the role of cost-benefit analysis? That's, that's a real challenge since these things are, you know, if you do your job, you're not going to see a crisis. And probably the hardest problem is the political economy, uh, political economy around accountability. So do the, I'll leave you with the following thought experiment. Imagine you go to the, the president and you say, I think you know, the probability of crisis in the next 25 years is, is pretty good. So it's, let's say it's a one in 25 chance that we're gonna have a crisis. But if we do the following, we can get it to one in 50, okay? Now, and here's roughly what we're gonna see in the costs in the very short run. Now, do you think you, you'd have a mandate to go out and do that? And, Imagine now you're 17 years into this. There's been no crisis. You've pushed it back to one in 50 instead of one in 25. You think about all the um, inertia that's built into the system that you know, tries to undo regulations over time. I think it'd be, it'd be difficult to sustain the support as the you know, crisis fades, especially if the costs were quite visible. And yet, if you don't have something like that, it's hard to know why, um, you know, why this is going to make such a difference. So you, you've got to find a way, even if the committee's working well and you don't have very many crises, that you can somehow um, prevent the kind of steady erosion of, of will on the part of the regulators.